This is Phantom Electric Ghost, and we're live on my Facebook channel. So it's Phantom Electric, Phantom Electric Ghost. And with, I want to make sure I got the name of your band right. Is it Man Dylan or Dillon? Yes. Uh, Mandelon. Mandelon. Okay, so good. Thank you for helping me with that. Now, we had sent you a bunch of questions through the, through the um, Instagram and your email. And we like to talk to you guys about about your band. You're you're a, you're formed in Sweden back in what 20, 2006? Yeah, we did uh, playing music all our lives. But uh, two thousand six, we started the uh, mandolin. Mandolin. Now, usually I, I'm going to go through the questions, and then we'll kind of get get to where you are today. But the first question I always ask the artists I talk to. All right, like when did you first get into music? At what age? Who wants to go first? Yeah, you can go first. I can go. Well, I, I come from a, a family where a lot of um, my relatives play music. So um, I think I wrote my first song when I was just five years old. And I've been playing the guitars ever since. And um, uh, music has always been a very important part of my childhood and my DNA. And uh, but I think I actually was pretty old before I discovered that I had any kind of talent. I just mm. played music. I didn't think about if I had talent or not. So, but when I was uh, perhaps 20 years old, people told me, wow, you have this unique uh, musical DNA and you have this androgynous uh, voices. So, so yeah. What about you, Jonathan? <laughs> what about me? Yeah, it, for me, it was like the typical drummer story I was hitting around on pots and pans at home and uh, one day I got myself a drum kit and uh, yeah I'm here today <laughs> <laughs> so was that that I always drummers always tell me that they had a hard time with, um, with your practice so your parents were cool with you being a drummer uh, sorry again your parents were cool with you being a drummer because of the noise, uh, I, th I think my uh, my mother really wanted. She <laughs> No, but I, I think I think my mother really wanted me to play like violin or guitar. Or <laughs> so I, um, now she's pretty happy, I think. But like when I was five, six, seven years old, she wasn't so happy about that it. That was a struggle. <laughs> um, my so when. <laughs> came into my bedroom and asked if I heard a cat because when I played electric guitar she she was afraid that I was torturing the cat but I told her I <laughs> to be a good guitarist <laughs> yeah so it's it's I, I think it's interesting um like a lot of people start young it's just like when did you realize that you could write your own music because a lot of people start they you know they they tell me a lot of musicians I tell them, oh I was inspired by the Beatles I was inspired by, you know, Madonna. I was inspired by Nirvana. Um, you know, the different places that people come from are inspired by The Clash or whatever, or Bowie. Um, when did you feel like you had something to say and you weren't just going to try to emulate the people you loved? W when did you think that you actually started to write, have your own voice? It's, it's hard to tell, but, but nowadays, man, long you know, we are always been uh, people call it these, you know, gloomy music. Yeah, uh, um, we, we, we compare to Opus and Goth and Catatonia, you know, the Swedish uh, Gothic scene. But uh, mm -hmm. I think in our DNA, we have actually a lot of folk music uh, in us. And and even if we try to pretend that we don't have it, we cannot run it from it because whatever we write and do, they're always. There's a big Swedish and um, Scandinavian folk music in our genes and in our music. A bit sadness, a bit gloominess, and a bit darkness. I don't mm -hmm. know if I <laughs> And whatever. Well, I think it's do, good to have that kind of traditional basis in your kind of like where you come from in your musical bones, you know, is like that's where you start. A lot of guys, you know, start with classical when they really didn't like it and then they kind of break out of it. Um, because it's like it's too rigid and they want to be able to go somewhere. But I think folk music is a really cool place to come from. Because if you think about it, like an American folk music, like Americana, you think about like the Johnny Cash's, the Waylon Jennings, like the band, uh, Bill, Dylan's backup band, that kind of feel, it has a lot of heart. And I think it has a lot of soul and I think it has a lot of honesty. 
it's kind of like the way punk music has an honesty to it. And I think when you come from that kind of place, I think it helps your songwriting. Yeah, I think so. And it's, it's, uh, it's something, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's got this kind of soul, it, this, uh, a special kind of feelings to it uh, that you cannot emulate. It's rather real or not. So, so we are proud of our Scandinavian. Yes, the Viking. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's also like, I, I will also into this uh, American crossroads music, like, for example, one called The Horseflies. Um, and no, not many American know about them. Not many people know, but I do. I love them. Yes. So there is a lot of good music out there, and think um, a lot of it comes from folk music. Well, especially here in Scandinavia, I think also if you listen to Scandinavian music like Alba, there is a lot of Scandinavian yeah. folk tones. In so. Yeah, it's interesting. I was watching a, a documentary on Alba, and I think it was it was really brilliant how. They, they had come out of your traditional kind of folk tradition or the acoustic, you know, music. And that wasn't something that was going to, I think everybody who wants to be in a band, they want to make it on the BBC. They, they want to make it on American radio. And so they, they got to figure out how to emulate that. And, you know, Abba, that whole documentary just showed how they were able to, to, to learn and kind of, you know, come up with their own style. It was like it's Phil Spector kind of wall of sound yeah. that they were able to do cheaper because they found out how to do it through studio kind of trickery <laughs> or like studio capability to kind of layer without having to have the extent of all of those overdubs. Um, and I think that was really interesting to me because I always like to watch like music history uh, to see where bands are coming from. And uh, they, they inspired me a lot in terms of their songwriting. Um, and their sound. This is a very unique sound. To have two singers singing simultaneously the way they did still isn't really that common. Um, but but it's interesting, like your, your influences and your reference points, because you have this kind of and androgynous kind of Bowie-esque feel to your music. Um, so I'm wondering, is, is Bowie one of your inspirations? Can you David Bowie? Can we... <laughs> Yeah, I missed that. Oh, I, I didn't hear it. Repeat the question. Oh, you want me to repeat, repeat the question? Uh, well, I was asking if were you inspired by like David Bowie? Oh, you're kind of blocking. Hello? I think I lost you for a second. <laughs> Sorry, there's a yeah. yeah. We lost you for a second. There is a bad internet here in the woods, Sweden. We are uh, yeah. we are in the middle of yeah, yeah. The woods. Since we yeah. link can be accept this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Help you is just yeah. <laughs> yeah, the connection is kind of not yeah. going. Can, do you hear me now? No, we're kind of having a bad connection. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Oh, okay, I guess saying? the question was, I don't know if you <laughs> heard my question. I was asking where you're inspired by Bowie. D David Bowie. Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps uh, not so. Uh, we always listen to, to David Bowie and Ziggy Stardust this kind of stuff. And, and some people also compare our style with David Bowie. So it, it's an honor, but but uh, we had never had a goal to sound like David Bowie or anything else. But he's a great artist, and and, and he was a great artist, and, and a lot of cool sounds and a way of recording stuff. Uh, is a good interest artist, I think. And you know, our drummer, when he used makeup, he looked like he started. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think anytime somebody has that kind of eighties new wave, if you if you do a new wave and kind of Duran Duran look or like that new romantic style, like I'm I'm a big fan of the new romantic era. And I'm a synth player, so a lot of synth players that's yeah. what we, we kind of live in that era. And the whole idea was this high kind of hodgepodge of uh, you know progressive rock mixed with punk and then all this synth you know new wave synth stuff that and it's the an idea like bowie had all these ideas in the 70s with brian eno uh, and then he had his image he had this yeah. very theatrical image he was kind of freddie murphy like but like more like space alien <laughs> um the, theater and I think a lot of bands like Duran Duran and the Flocks of Seagulls and New Order and Depeche Mode, they kind of felt like that they went in that direction. Uh, and so I think anybody that goes, even Prince, if you think about Prince, um, that kind of feel that you could you could go in this kind of gender bending way of, of presenting yourself with your stagecraft. That I think is, uh, you know, I think a lot of bands can, can go back to that. I mean, a lot of what I do with Josephine Electric was inspired by Prince and Camille and Bowie and all that. Um, just because I found that as a, a way to have a, a new way to have a voice for my music through Josephine. So I, I, I kind of feel what, what you're doing with your, 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 your presentation and your stagecraft. Yeah, I think we, because many of us talk about Marilyn Cole is this, this sometimes a British wave kind of music gets inspired from the 80s and David and Bowers and and and, and also with some of the lyrics are compared to Bauhaus and, and and you know the dark kind of music so it's it's a great honor for us for people to do that comparison but uh, and also we have this uh, almost unisex uh, performance because we we um, it's, it's hard to tell the band members uh, what gender they are and uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, I think gender you are. No, yeah. and you never will. <laughs> and uh, David Bowie did that great. And, and but yeah, I, I, this was very provoking. Uh, but now it's, I think uh, people find it still very interesting. There are some people that get provoking, and we always get this question: if we are gays or if we uh, mm. and, and stuff like that. And then we just say, yeah, we are. Yes, if you say, well, only when we are with your dad. Yes. <laughs> or the, the the, so, so. I think the interesting thing was in the 80s, people didn't really think to even challenge Freddie Mercury. You I mean, nobody ever really, you know, blatantly came up to him and said, oh, are you this? You know, are you that? Um, and when Prince was doing it, you know, people would just say, oh, that's the 80s, you know. And it was just this kind of thing that that's, it just felt right for him to carry that 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 stagecraft, you know, and if if we're, it seems like today everybody wants to put something on it and say, well, who are you? And a lot of times it's like it was a show, you know. It, I'm I'm do I'm 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 playing a character, right? And so I'm I'm this is what I do for my stagecraft, and I like to be like Peter Gabriel. You know, Peter Gabriel used to go into different modes, and sometimes he'd wear a dress, sometimes he'd wear a costume, and sometimes he looked like an alien. He do whatever the song yeah. service the song, and nobody really asked him, you know, what was his gender preference or anything. He was just doing it because that's what he felt wrong needed. So, do you just feel? Do you do your stagecraft to kind of sync up with your music, with your what the song means yeah. to you? Yeah, that's important, and and it's also because uh, I think uh, it's, it's also great to inspire the, the young generation because uh, uh, there is a lot of debate in Scandinavian Sweden about and, and about eco free and stuff like that. And, and um, so when we are this uh, genderless band, I think uh, some, some people get in because uh, it's, it's become even in the feminist play field. They can use our music as as a as a voice, and that's uh, also girls. So, yeah, uh, the man when we now have taken again, it's going to be even more graphic than before. We are going to to take the stage performance one step further, and uh, and uh, 
yeah, and play with gender and play with a lot of different effects and 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 discover perhaps my voice even more and um, the energy sound will get bigger and more exciting. Yes. yes. Can, can you can, can you elaborate yeah. more? So for the So, so is this for the 2021 new album? You're working on a new like performance stagecraft to go with the new album. Yeah, uh, we work a lot of and and, and we uh, we collaborate with with other artists, with Akis, with uh, with uh, we have dance group that's going to help us. So instead of just working with the music, we are simultaneously working with other art forms like uh, pictures, paintings. With oh, the theater. theater and stuff like that. So yeah. video directors and vi video artists. Yes, and that's they were a fun way to work because we don't know if we could be very successful, but we know that we can still create uh, good art and, and find uh, output for our our spirit, our motion, our and that's the main, the most important thing because. Uh, there is pretty hard to get through, you know, the, all the internet voice and to get your voice heard these days because, because there is so much music out there. But we are focusing in great music and art, and hopefully people will appreciate it and discover it. So when you guys um, broke up, like in um, 2009, you had gone into like film and you did like, your own solo album. And you did some stuff for churches yeah. and theaters. Is that kind of like, uh, were you always doing a lot of video stuff back when you started the band? Or is that something that you've gone into yeah. more now? No, I've always been, been writing music. And, and uh, so the, this, uh, the album we're working on will be my sixth album and you, your fourth album, I think. Yeah. So, so my fourth with you. Yeah. With, yeah. So, and then second man in all I've always been writing music and working in different projects and even when we did man alone, I did my folk music stuff and I also did my Swedish music stuff and uh, and we will still now we will focus uh, much of our energy with man alone, but I'm sure we will still will work with other projects as well. so it's it's art art is art um, it's like eating food, you know, you cannot eat only potato, even if it's good for your health. You must have different kind of food, food intake. So, and this is how we, we look at music and art. We will, we will have some fries once in a while as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but when I was listening, when I was listening um, to your, um, your album, A Good Excuse and A Yellow Sun, which I guess you've uh, re-released to streaming services, for 2021, but it originally came out what in uh, 2008. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the songs I really like yeah. a lot is "Gloomy Sunday." Can you talk about how "Gloomy Sunday" came about? Well, actually, uh, that is one of the oldest songs on the album. Um, I wrote "Gloomy Sunday." I think I was in. A bit uh, gloomy mood that day and I think I wrote it back in 2004 2005 back then was in Sweden and it uh, came to me and I think I wrote some 15 minutes or some, something uh, often the music come from the lyrics. that song it came hand in hand the lyrics and song and then I recorded it on the, back then on a tape player, you know, a Porta Studio, a cassette player. Uh, yeah. And later it we moved in the Fashion Nation Street Studios in Sweden. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, and actually, on the new album, we will, uh, we will, the Gloomy Sunday team that we use, uh, uh, we will use it once again. It will be a, a new song, but it will be a part two of that song. Um, oh, are you making a, is it a variation or just a continuation? It's a continuation. It's going to be called Gloomy Monday. <laughs> no, no, it's Gloomy Monday. It's good. But it's, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we will continue to travel. So people that heard Gloomy Sunday will think, aha, this is uh, 
I, I, yeah. I know this one, but uh, it's a couple yeah. of new lyrics, but it's in the same field and it's actually a um, uh, uh, in my, yeah, you can say it's, it's the part two of Gloomy Sunday. Yeah. Is it something that you wrote? Did you write it back then and pick it back up, or is it brand new? Is it, is it I, I started to write, write it back then, and uh, we plan to actually have that also on the record, but it it weird ten songs and two that uh, same it was so similar there. So so I kind of forgot got it, but back a uh, year ago I remember it again. I think oh, this. Uh, uh, up again so i recorded it in my studio because i built my own studio now so mm -hmm. so i recorded it and it it very it's a very fun song also to play on a guitar because it's so easy and it's so logical and it's uh, in mathematics mm -hmm. so it's a fun song to play i mean yeah, i like the feel of it that it had that kind of 80s had that kind of new wave feel to it new romantic feel that's what i liked about it um so you talked about you did this one, but you did this like on a Tascam or a Fostex like tape recorder when you originally did it, the original song, Gloomy Sunday. You know, you did on a tape. Early 2000 before. Yeah. Before the Cubase and all that stuff, you know, we had this all, uh, this old cassette player. So we, when we had a uh, tape recorder, so when when we had an iPod on the this tape recorder, and then we went back to the studio and did a real recording. And um, I mm -hmm. actually sometimes miss the old kind of writing music. Uh, now, you of course, when you have, have an idea, you play, you take your mobile phone and you record stuff. And uh, but I, yeah. I, I miss the old days when you have wreck and play yeah, I, and <laughs> old cassette. Then. <laughs> yeah, a lot of what I do is I still I still have an old four track Tascam. And I like I like to lay things down because I use a lot of analog gear. I got a lot of modes and stuff, and I find it's cool to kind of do lo-fi stuff with um, analog tape, especially like if you're trying to capture an analog synth. It just sounds kind of more warm if you put it on the tape. And then I'll bring it over. I might sample it and then bring it into a modern DAW. Um, but I like to kind of put the ideas down on old four trackers because the cool thing then is you kind of have to do the whole song. What I like about it is like, if you go back in the old day, if you put something down on a four tracker, you kind of had to actually know the song. You end up learning the song cause you're right. And you had to play everything. You couldn't just go onto the grid yeah. and fix it. You had to actually get it down to at least a demo format. And then you actually knew the song, you know, and I kind of like that. I still like the record that way. <laughs> I also love, love the analog way of recording. So when we record this new album, we use this a, a lot of uh, old analog Swedish made stuff, and it's it's so fun to record that way. And I have be, uh, have this honor because we have a great drummer that actually can play drums. That's, that's me. That's me. <laughs> that can play drums for me. And, and some parts are also, uh, of course, is, is played live in the studio because. Um, we love the old oh, so you, way to record stuff. So is there a full band? Is there like a four piece or five piece band? What's the full size of your band? Do you like record as a band and mic it? And like so you're all playing live and, and kind of track it that way, or do you kind of kind of do it overdub? Yeah. And we are four people uh, when we play, play live and uh, and um, and uh, yeah, we me and uh, I'm the singer and one. I I I. am the singer and I also play the guitar and I have one guitarist and one bass player and this guy. And and sometimes we are also use uh, this backtrack machine when we have the synthesizers. But nowadays mm -hmm. we use have this extra person with us that has uh, play actually the synthesizer because um, it's hard to improv improvise when you go no we got everything on backtracks because if it something failed you have to start from yeah. the beginning so uh, yeah you kind of locked in <laughs> yeah so you, it's, it's kind of old school it's yeah well, i'm <laughs> i'm a keyboard player so i kind of appreciate that i appreciate when people bring live keyboard players back instead of just running yeah. 
backing tracks because it's kind of like that's my business, you know, <laughs> being a keyboard player. So, it, like, there was this, this is, I don't know, last couple of years, a lot of people were kind of into backing tracks and not having like the 80s type of keyboard players involved because either you could just run a backing track on an MPC or, you know, you could just run it off your DAW, off of Ableton. But then what I found is like bands started saying, well, I'm kind of locked into that. And then I can't improvise as much. Because if I have the keyboard player, they can improvise, right? Because he can kind of feel where the band's going and you don't have to be locked in. And so I think yeah. a lot of people who like, to, you know, still play guitars, still play basses, play, play drums. It just feels better if you have that kind of setup, at least for me. I'm, 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 I'm kind of from the 80s. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, that's my preferred way of doing things, but. Yeah, and, and that's, the, we discovered that when we are working with other projects now, to have this pre-recorded stuff, it only makes us stressed out. It's, it's more easy to have more people. And the good thing even in Sweden is, you know, there is so many good musicians here, so it's so easy to find good musicians to have, wow, cool. have in Mandalon because everyone almost plays because music is a big part of learning in the school. So, uh, so we are we have a privilege. A lot, a lot of good studio musicians, a lot of a lot of good players. So you've got a good choice. It's like if you're in LA, like if you're in Los Angeles. Or if you're in New York City and you jump into a studio, there's always like a bunch of bass players, tons of drummers. There's like if you're if you if your drummer doesn't yeah. show up <laughs> or your bass players stuck at the bar, <laughs> you, you can get somebody else to come in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like this is weird. This old John and he picks everything. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and we will realize that now after COVID, we will. We will also we will be a lot of more people on stage, fakirs, and you know, working with fires and stuff like that. And and we, we I like to see Mandel nowadays more like an artist than just a, a, a band, because the art is the main thing nowadays. It's a visual thing. It's a yeah it's a theater thing. It's that kind of brings thing. me to um you know the whole idea that like I was. I was inspired as a young kid to get into music by like looking at Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground. Now, if you ever knew the whole stories, yeah. the Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground, their whole thing was like it was this art show, and so Lou Reed would be on stage, and then Andy Warhol would have all these screens up running visuals of his art films. So he have all these art films running behind the band, and then he'd have models yeah. sitting around. You know, actors sitting around and it was like a happening and and, and to me when I, used, I used to go watch old films of it and then bowie kind of took some of those ideas and put them into life but but that whole idea of having this kind of art m merged with film you know merged with music i think a lot of bands you know in the scene with a lot of electronic bands you know try to do that today a lot of modular bands try to work with film directors or work with, you know, actors and models to do like little plays, you know, on stage in New York, you can go and see when before COVID, there were people doing these weird kind of happening, merging things with film students. So you get a bunch of electronic bands working with a bunch of film students and then you run something. So it sounds like that's what you're trying to do there. Is that, is that the kind of idea? Yeah. Um because uh, the, there is so many ways to express uh, music and uh, lyrics and stuff, and, and it, give, it gives it a one more dimension to, to use other art form as well. And, and, and uh, it's, to be honest, it's fun to work with other artists, you know, with, with uh, dance and uh, fashion and stuff, because, uh, you know, five minutes before we go on stage, we are in this, this big, strong team together, and we are in this together. And if it's just hundred people in the audience, we always give everything because we believe in this so much together, and we want to give the audience a good experience. And we want also to challenge, perhaps, uh, you know, this more commercial 
band and you know the big record companies they own history so so it's good to get them or uh, a knock <laughs> and yeah i think it's good to diversify it, it's good to diversify into other art forms because of the way the record industry is like if you can get into film if yeah. you can get into dance if you can get your your show to be yeah. something that people want to see because it's more than just music because it's art i think that gives you an advantage because then suddenly you've got some content you can put on youtube You've got content that could be filmed. You've got people that can hear about you that maybe wouldn't have thought about seeing you because they just didn't want to see a band. They wanted to see the dancers. They want to see the film. They want to see the other art. So I think you can widen your audience. And that's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It, uh... Well, so we hope that this Corona thing will disappear soon, so we can be out there, you know, town. Yes, and making love <laughs> music. So. Yes. So, so you guys got back together after breaking up because of COVID kind of kind of brought you guys back together. Yeah, we always been good friends, and we always been loving each other and working all together on other projects, and and. Uh, uh, and then we had this uh, last year we should with our Swedish uh, music we should do this big theater tour but that uh, that vote came and we did we did like one we did the first show, show the premiere it was uh, sold out and you know fantastic reviews but then the corona came so it, i think we got us a little bit depressed because now we was on the brink to this <laughs> big break we were in sweden and then the corona came. yeah so then we decided well we we want to do rock music let's let's do man let's do it good and yeah, let's do it hard and let's especially when something like corona happens it actually inspires to write some good news yeah yeah i think hard times kind of dictate great, great music like if you go back to like the 60s you know from like 66 to 1970 was such a volatile period in the world and they created really good music because of what was going on in the in the scene you know and so i think that you know the vietnam war that all the you know the whole issue of civil rights in the u.s and there's a lot there was a lot going on with the hippie culture and then the lsd and free love and is it the whole hippie movement it just brought you know focus into art and music that i think COVID is from my what i have experienced in interviewing bands all during COVID. I found a lot of bands were kind of like honing in on what they love about music. Um, and maybe they couldn't tour, but they all started to write. Like in almost every band I've talked to uh, since last year, um, have spent a lot of time yeah. rediscovering why they love music and, and putting a lot of work into another, I think a lot of depth into new music that is informed by what's happened. And I think that's gonna you know, be pay dividends for all the bands because when you, when you have something really strong to say or you have emotion because of what's going on and you put that in your music, even if you're not directly talking about it, I think this whole situation has created a lot of opportunity for artists from a creative standpoint. What do you think about this pandemic is, you know, there is so many good musicians now out of work. So, so when, for example, for a couple of weeks, I needed to find some vocalists to do some backup vocals just for fun. It was easy to find that. And when we look, for example, find someone to play the cello, uh, the cello? Oh. Oh. it was easy to find that because everyone's out of work. But um, so... So there is some points about this as well, and I think also it brought many of us musicians stronger together because uh, we 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 are not competitive. Level. We are more um, but It's more. Uh, I think this will create a more friendly vibe between musicians and, and artists. 
I think this year, 2021, we will expect some uh, really good records coming out that was recorded last year. Oh, yeah. As well. A lot of good music will come, I think. And also, instead of just, just fast music that the record companies throws in your face all the time, a lot of this album has been well produced and, and really uh, there is a thought into it. So I think there, there will be a lot of good music from this pandemic. We hope so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the things I've heard, I've heard from a lot of bands is because you don't have to tour, the amount of time you can spend honing the songs is more than what we've ever been given. Like most of the artists I've talked to said and I've been able to spend more time on their record because they normally have to tour. You know, because the only way we make money usually is we have to tour really heavy. At least in the U.S., yeah, and I think that's pretty worldwide. It's like because we don't really make a lot of money from selling the music. You, you make more money from actually playing shows, and so we typically have been so busy in a typical year that you don't have a lot of time to actually hone your record. You know, you you'll work on it, and but you don't have a dedicated period of time where that's all you can focus on. And I think that is going to be very yeah. significant in the quality of the music that's coming out. Yeah, I think so. Me too. So, oh yeah. But it needs to be out there and playing. But uh, yes, <laughs> the Corona will stay. Then we will be ready. I think. But uh, a bad, bad thing. A lot of musicians will be ready. So if there was, it will be a lot of comp competition. Yeah. But. Uh, we will do our best. <laughs> so you guys are still not able to... So you're not able to do live shows yet, right? You, you guys aren't authorized to do live live shows and venues yet, right? Yeah. We have always done a lot of live shows, and it's kind of been a, a very important part of our identity. And when it's coronavirus, I think it was hard for many of us in a band because, you know, that has been the way that people know us and that has been a very important part of us. Um, but uh, we have found other ways to gain uh, love and, yeah. But uh, we miss it, we do. But the, the yeah. level we also really, really try to make this album a great album, the best we ever made. So. So there will be a, a big scene for us out there when when the virus is over. And also we will, of course, we can also do live performance uh, uh, on the internet, of course. So that's something we, we will probably do in the future. Yeah, do some live, live streams. Yeah. No, so I've seen some... Also when, uh, yeah. Are you guys going to do like yeah. live streams? <laughs> From, from like a venue that's set up without an audience so that you still have like a stage feel? Or are you gonna do it from like a studio? Do you have ideas of like, how are you gonna do live streaming? I think we will actually, yeah, I think we will write, rent a, a theater scene and perhaps uh, uh, do some a, a live concert from there without an audience and just stream out loud live because there is something magic about doing stuff live uh, even if you playing you the wrong street, but it, it's still live. So it's it's wonderful to do something live, and I think the audience also appreciate it. So. Yeah, we've yeah. seen some and bands in the U.S. actually. Yeah, some bands in the U.S. have actually like booked like closed venues and then live streamed with multiple cameras, like like a festival. Basically, it's a festival show without an audience, but it's in live yeah. fed, and then people buy tickets. And so, companies that are setting up like bands to be able to do these live venues with no audience, they sell the tickets on the net, yeah. and you know, and they and they they're getting fans to to actually, yeah, I want to see that band, so they do it. I've seen the, the Gorillas did that in London, a band in. Um, called Tennis from Colorado, did that. Um, and so we're starting to see in the US, you know, bands in, in England, I've seen a couple bands, like I said, the Gorillas did that around Christmas time. Um, 
So it seems like, okay, well, I think the fans, if they can't see bands, you know, physically will be willing to do that for the bands they're really into. So I think, it, you know, I think we just have to figure out new ways to present ourselves as musicians, I think. So are you guys working on videos for the new record? Like videos that you would put, like official music videos? Oh, yeah. The point is that we are not only making one video, we're making a video for all the songs on the album, and it will oh. be like a, a, a series. Um, uh, like a music video series. Yes, coming out like a different song. episode. So we have 10 episodes, and uh, we will start to release one single, and that will be like one episode of the, the bigger movie. So, so, so when we release the album, the whole all the videos will be out there so and we are so on sunday was, yes so and there is a lot of uh, fun stuff in the videos and it will the videos will take us back to the 1920s and uh, Ooh, 20. and you know they're back where, when uh, when there were freak shows and stuff like that so it will be pretty wish, visual and and a bit provoking i think uh, but uh, we have a sign, and it's been through one, uh, so we will get back to you about that. We will send you the first video so you can watch it, because it will be a bit, bit different. That's, that sounds really cool, <laughs> because I, I think the gorillas, like I mentioned, um, they're, they're, they're very, very much into using like their cartoon image of the band, and they had, I think in the last year, they did like a project where they had videos released as like episodes and then they did these little short episodes yeah. for every song they released and i think it was very successful because people you know they, they were supposed to tour and they couldn't tour but they did this video with their with the artists like jamie who does all their art the guy who did like tank girl he's a professional cartoonist and he did all these like videos to go with every song with a lot of this animation that's associated with their band and that's um that has always been a big inspiration to me because i do i do some stuff with my music where i try to bring in characters and images but um i think a video project like that are you thinking that you would you present it as a whole piece like a dvd or a video release that and, and then push it out as a full like uh movie at the end or yeah we thought perhaps uh, uh, re release a couple of singles, two, two, three singles, and then we rent uh, uh, cinemas and release the, the movie and album on the cinema cinema uh, after Corona. And um, oh. so, so we have started to negotiate with some cinemas here in Sweden. And um, but of course, we will also release it on on YouTube and and for DVD, <laughs> but not so many people use it, you know, see this in DVD. Maybe, so maybe well. we can uh, get Netflix to uh, oh, yeah. buy our music video. Oh, they can buy it. They can get it for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I know some people like the packaging with a band, you know, like in the U.S., one thing that's kind of big right now is vinyl. So I don't know if vinyl is big in Sweden, but a lot of a lot of people have found that, you know, when, when you really can't get people to buy CDs, but people are willing to buy tapes and they seem to be willing to buy vinyl, yeah. at least in the U S do you have that same thing going on in Sweden of people getting back into vinyl? Yeah. Oh yeah. Vinyl thing. And the news now is cassettes. There are also being yeah. upswing in that, but the vinyl is very big, but the CD is stone dead, but the vinyl is very big. So they are opening new, new vinyl stores and stuff like that. And there was also a factory where it, they produce it, this stuff here around, but uh, the scene is that, but vinyl is the line. And uh, the cassette disc got this um, romantic, uh, nostalgia stuff, stuff over it. So I don't buy it, but a lot of people love them. <laughs> well, I think what happens is like, well, you know, I was a, you know, I'm a big music fan and I got a big vinyl collection. I think the thing that a lot of fans like is in this digital age, it's cool to have your your favorite artist you have something physical from them right so you get a t-shirt you get a poster but if you get vinyl the cool the i think the the the, the appeal of vinyl 
is you get a big canvas and then the band presents their art to you in this bigger canvas, right? So you can get liner notes that you can actually read. You can get really interesting artwork. And I think it pulls you into the whole vibe of the band. And so it's more than just listening to a Spotify playlist. You're actually able to kind of feel the, the full mystique of a band. You know, I remember picking up a Led Zeppelin album and it had like a spinning wheel and you would sit there, you listen to the whole thing and you're looking at the liner notes and you're spinning the wheel or you're looking at all the artwork and it kind of pulled you into the band and made you want to focus on the band. And I think that's a cool thing if you think about it in a world where people are listening to two minutes of your song on a playlist with 20 other bands. When you get back to vinyl, they'll listen to your whole project. So they kind of get pulled oh, into yeah. your vibe. Yeah. So, yeah, it's 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 a bit expensive to to do the vinyl, but but it's worth it because you will probably make up for the money pretty soon by selling them on on live gigs or stuff like that. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. I found that like if I go to a live gig yeah. in New, in New York, and I sell like. Yeah. my vinyl and a bunch of live gigs i'll make more money than i make on spotify all year <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. not not to push down spotify because i'm actually working for me, but um, <laughs> but uh you know kind of like you gotta do what you gotta do to make money as a musician you know you kind of do what you need to do but um it's kind of like we used to sell the cassettes out the back of our trunk in the hood. <laughs> um, and I guess that's coming back. <laughs> so, so you guys are excited about the new record. What, what's the target date for the new new record to come out? Or are you just releasing singles and then the record? Oh, uh, I just asked about like I know you said you're releasing like the art project. Are you gonna do the film for you know the video for every song? But is there an overall like album coming out for 2021? We think the first uh, the first comp perhaps in a one and a half month. Then and the album we we do not have a date for it, but it depends also if there is a. Or the record company that want to release it, or if we want to do it for our eyes, for uh, by ourselves. Okay. So, so there are, also, but we have any new contracts, anything. But we will at least uh, uh, the first episode of this and the videos and the single will we, we will release it in perhaps one and a half month, and then we will see how big the interest is. But uh, we hope okay. that we also can do you know the LP and stuff like that because. Uh, we love the LP and the warmth, you know, the sound uh, from the LP, it's, it's something different. It sounds other, it, it sounds like... Another dimension. Yeah, I love it. So you got the whole, the record's totally in the can, you're done, you finished the record, you just got to figure out uh, how you present the video projects and you're going to do this first one in a month and a half and then you're going to see the reaction and then you, you've got, you know, planning from there, you'll release maybe singles uh, and then see how that goes. And then eventually, if, if you get enough enough people showing a heavy interest, then you'll go forward with other things. Yeah. And we will, so, so we will, we will uh, yeah. So it will be interesting to see how much people we can get the truth with the first single. It's pretty hard nowadays, you know, to get through all this internet the noise. There is so many good bands out there and and we yeah. have never been good at this so the stuff. We think that's it's pretty hard to do, but we we're learning and we we're trying to get out there and and I'm sure that we will new people will discover our music. But as we said for uh, we always at least try to make good music and good art and then we can just hope and pray that people also will discover it. So. Yeah. Well, I, I was listening to your album again. Another song that I really like is um, Mother. So um, 
yeah. from your from your album, A Good Excuse and a Yellow Sun. So can maybe you talk about that that song a little bit. Yeah, it's it's written from uh, about my mother, and it's and it's it's about these you know the bad days and and, and um, how I could see my mom's pain and how she suffered and stuff like that, and also how she's always been supportive uh, in her own kind of way. Uh, so it was a very emotional song to write, and also a very emotional song to record, and. So when we, I think I took eight or nine hours just to record a vocal because it was uh, not so technical uh, hard because that had uh, never been an issue, but it was a bit uh, hard for me uh, in a mental way. Um, but that's, that is a song that we, we always play live on live show because it's, uh, people seem to like it because they feel that it's real for some reason. Yeah, it feels like it's a personal expression you know it's it's cool I love, what i love about singer songwriters is the fact that you're you're getting a window into their into their life and a lot of singer songwriters are are willing to kind of take a part of themselves and put it in the song and it's not just like it was written by some producer and it's just a banger hit right it's not that that's a bad thing but i think what people like about singer songwriters is they're actually getting the story from the artist themselves, direct. It's not filtered yeah. through through bunch of, you know, like professional writers and other people. It's actually that person's like reading a, a novel. You know, I always found that like reading, listening to good singer songwriters is like reading a good novel. Is you're getting into the heart of the person, you know? Oh yeah, and that's a good thing. With it. we are not on a big record company, so. So we are so free in our expression. We can write and say whatever we want. And there is not a, a producer that tells us to, to write in a specific way. And that's a good thing because then it comes directly from, from our hearts. Sometimes uh, the lyrics can be perhaps a bit difficult to understand, a bit cryptic, but it, it's us and it's for real. And, and that's, I think it's very important for us to, to always be real and to be honest about stuff. And um, yeah, we write songs that, that actually has happened. And, and on the ballad, there is a girl that I sing about that I really love. Uh, and I think uh, it's interesting about not just fictional stuff, it's, it's directly from the heart. Now, the title track, I like again, maybe like an understanding of um what's the feeling for a good excuse in the yellow sun is like what what's that did that come from something that happened in your life uh, well uh, actually when we were in the studio and we we're going to record that song i did not have a name for for the specific song but we was all always joking about if you have a good excuse for stuff it will make your life easier. And if the sun is shining, it will also make your life. So good excuse and a yellow one will make uh, our hard life good enough. It's more like that, almost as expression. So then we decided, wow, it sounds pretty weird but uh, and goofy. But we call the song that and also the album that. Because uh, even if the it was a ballad, we wanted we thought in a lyrical way it kept what man was in its essence by that song so and uh, we always play that song live as well and it's always very mm -hmm. fun to play and yeah always cry. I, I, yeah, I enjoy it always. well i think the whole record is really good i mean i i i like to listen to albums I'm an album guy. I don't like to just listen to singles. And I like the feel of the record. It feels like all the songs belong in it as an album, yeah. you know? And it, 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 it feels like a complete picture of who you guys are. Um, maybe it's not the full picture, but I get a good sense of your sound and I get a good sense of what you're trying to lay down. And I like it and I like the feel. Um, and I do like the honesty. 
you know, that's, that's part of what I like when I listen to a band, you know, I like to hear, even if I don't understand the cryptic stuff and I'll go back and keep on listening to it to get a feel. And then I get my own interpretation of what I think you're trying to lay down. And I think that's, you know, the great part of music, you know, and why I like to interview bands that are uh, in the indie scene is because I think that's where all the energy in, in, the, in, the, in the market is. All the energy in the scene is coming from bands like you guys. You know, it's coming from people who believe in what they do so much that they put their own money and their own effort into it. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate guys that do that. And uh, uh, and the girls that do that too. You know, I talked to a lot of different people. And you guys are, I really like your music. And I think it's like, I, I wanted to present it to my audience because I think they need to hear what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, we appreciate you that you like our music. <laughs> so, it's just why, why I do the podcast is like, you know, as a musician myself, I think it's good. And in this COVID environment, it's kind of a, a, a real benefit for me. It's an honor to be able to talk to all these musicians. I mean, every week I talk to maybe four or five musicians from around the world. And I get to, I get to hear new things all the time. Uh, and I get to hear different ways of thinking about music and different, you know, how other artists are, are working and struggling and doing what they love. And I just like to be able to tell that story, um, which is why we do this. So, like, what I want to extend is um, an invitation when you guys want to push out, like, your, your next project, um, that you guys can come on the show. Um, I don't know if the anchor part will work. Maybe we could do this again. Um, but we have other ways of doing this. We can we could do, like, a YouTube or a Facebook. We can use this if this is not working for you or is working. Um, but yeah, we're, we're glad to have you on the program. One thing we can do is um, this video version of the podcast can be converted so I can put it out on my anchor. And the re one reason I want to do that is because on anchor, I can push it out to Spotify and Apple and like uh, nine other podcast platforms. And so I'm going to actually convert this to an audio version and push it onto anchor so I can get it on Spotify and get it onto Apple Podcasts so you get to a wider audience. So, so I'm gonna do that plus the Facebook version. And I'll put this on YouTube as well. And I'll send you those links when it's uh, ready. Thank you so much, we appreciate it. And uh, we, we wanted to get back to you with a new music because uh, I'm- uh, yeah, yeah, we have to do a part two of this interview when you have heard some of the new songs. Yeah. Well, oh we yeah. will be the first to hear them. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm so, down with that. You send me that stuff, and as soon as you're ready to start talking about it, I know you want to get it out there and market it. So when it, whenever it has the best marketing impact, let me know when I can help you with that. You know, that's I kind of, you know, it's the timing and everything is is important. So whenever that works for you, you think it's the best time to do that. Let me know. Yeah, we appreciate it. That sounds fantastic. And and um, yeah. And if you are in Sweden, so come and play, so we can play together. Well, well, I, I have a book. I have a book. I have a booking agent in uh, London, and I was supposed to come to wow. Europe, and uh, COVID happened. So once everybody gets wow, vaccinated, yeah. then my agent is going to try to get me to Berlin, and they're going to try to get me to London. And I know that people listen to me in Sweden. People, I actually have talked to other bands in Sweden. In, in in Norway and and uh, Holland and so I, I've always been wanting to get into Scandinavia because I, I actually have a lot of fans that listen to me in your neck of the woods. So uh, I would definitely love to get into that scene because you guys are in seem to appreciate the kind of stuff I'm doing. A lot of my fans seem to be from outside the U.S. So um, I'm I'm willing to go there. <laughs> Yeah, let, let's do a co-headlining tour of Scandinavia. Yeah, it would be great. Oh, you will love I'd, it I'd, because I'd be down for that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you guys for being on the show. So we're we're going to end our broadcast on Facebook, and uh, you know the Facebook link will be permanent after this, 
and then we'll push you the copies of the of the podcast that we push out after. And we'll send them to you through our direct message that we've been doing. But thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Is it, is, it, is it nighttime or daytime? Is it nighttime or daytime there? Good Good okay. Good night. Good night. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care.